I'm Tony Bruski. Welcome. We hope you've enjoyed our coverage on the trial of Alec Murdoch. This is a look back at some of the key moments and conversations that we've had over the last several weeks regarding the case. This is a podcast that seeks justice. Justice for the lives stolen by those in society that hide amongst us every day. Hidden in our towns, cities, and countrysides, the places that we work, and sometimes in our very own homes. This is Hidden Killers. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Tony Bruski. Thank you for joining us today. We're talking the Alec Murtaugh case with former Deputy District Attorney and experienced Alameda County criminal defense lawyer, Lewis Goodman. Uh, Lewis, welcome to the program. Great to have you back. I, I want to talk about all of the information uh, that has been coming out in the case and now presented to the jury, the judge saying that this is important, that they have some connections here, have some context, if you will, into the financial crimes of Alec Murdoch, because it does seem to possibly link into the murder case as well, possibly as motive, obviously something that is not required to be connected or presented, but is something that juries definitely are looking for. What are your thoughts on all of this being displayed right now? And one could argue that it, it, they are two different crimes. Just because you stole millions of dollars doesn't necessarily make you a murderer per se. Tony, as you know, motive is not an element of any crime, mm -mm. but jurors want to know what the motive is. Once jurors, and for that matter, the, the public, uh, has their first question answered. The first question is, who did this? Mm -hmm. The second question is, why did this person do it? Interestingly, it's been my experience that people who are charged with crimes tend to get charged with the same crime over and over again. So thieves get charged with thefts and DUI drivers get charged with drunk driving and domestic violence people get charged with domestic violence. And usually you don't see a lot of crossover mm -hmm. in this situation. I think that that motive question is answered by looking at the other things that this individual has done in his life, which has to do with the illegal grabbing of money that's not his. And, and context to me is always important. I know in, in court, sometimes it's, let's just keep this narrow focus. We're only looking at this specific crime. We don't need to know about all these other things. And obviously that's been what the defense of Murdoch kind of wanted to have keep happen. Uh, however, that's not the, the way it goes. Is this, I mean, obviously it's detrimental to the defense, but was it called for? Is it appropriate that all of that information be given to the jury to, to make a better decision uh, on his fate? Again, obviously motive not required, but it certainly does paint one. Defendants, generally speaking, don't want more information about their past lives to come into evidence mm -hmm. because it's generally used against them. And in this case, that's precisely what's going on is the prosecution wants to show that motive. And in doing so, they want to bring in prior acts of bad conduct. And the evidence codes, generally speaking, do allow for evidence of prior conduct to come into evidence to show modus operandi mm -hmm. uh, or how the crime is committed. Now, in this case, it's not so much that the th prior theft offenses go to show how the murder was committed, but it does very much go, as we just mentioned, to showing motive. And I think that uh, it'll if the case ends up with a conviction and there is an appeal, uh, the judge's decision to allow this bit of evidence in may very well be a grounds for appeal. And then we'd have to see what the appellate courts think in terms of whether uh, the judge's action was appropriate or not. But the jury is certainly going to hear about it. And I think the jury is going to find that bit of evidence very interesting. 
Is that a tough decision for a judge to make, knowing that uh, adding this in is probably appropriate, so they do have context, but also knowing that the likelihood of him being convicted is there, and then almost creating an out for him to appeal? I think you have to look at it from the judge's point of view, which is no judge likes to be reversed. On the other hand, I think that judges tend to say, what do I really think is the right thing to do at this time? And if some other judge says that I made a mistake, so be it. If there were to be an appeal and, and in, in almost any case like this, would there not be an attempt to make some sort of appeal if found guilty? There's going to be an appeal. If yes. he's found guilty, there's going to be, be an appeal. There is no doubt about it. In a case like this, uh, th there will be an appeal. There's no reason not to have an appeal. How easy is it then for that appeal to be turned down? How how does that process work for our audience? Well, I can't speak specifically to the Arkansas uh, uh, well, it's not Arkansas. You're no, sorry. I'm in the, Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> this is South Carolina. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. The um, I, I can't speak specifically to the uh, South Carolina uh, appellate process, but generally speaking, they tend to work the same. Uh, and the, the 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 question is going to be whether the uh, judge made a mistake and the and the appellate court may very well say no the judge didn't make a mistake the judge was well within his rights to allow this bit of evidence in and if so that ends it there and the other possibility is that the court could say the appellate court could say uh well the judge made a mistake letting it in but it is not uh a sufficiently erroneous decision so that it would require overturning the case. Uh, it's referred to oftentimes as harmless error. And I, I think that also people need to understand there's basically only three reasons that a case get over, gets overturned. Mm -hmm. The judge makes a mistake. The prosecutor makes a mistake with some sort of prosecutorial misconduct. The defense attorney makes a mistake by providing ineffective assistance of counsel. And Virtually every criminal case that's appealed, all three of those issues are raised. How how easy is this to get this appealed from what we know thus far and what's what's come out uh, to be successful in an appeal? Obviously, anyone can can request that, but for it to actually happen and for it to to get another shot at court and a retrial, is there uh, is there much likelihood on something like this? It's 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 really hard to say, and I don't even like to discuss the appellate process until no. there's actually a conviction. Sure, but appeals are for losers. Sure, sure. It, it's uh, the the case that I can think of where the uh, appellate uh, court uh, granted the the new trial would be uh, the one. Remember the staircase? Uh, did you follow that one at all? A, a little, a little bit. I mean, yeah. I have I have some familiarity sure. with it, but. Sure. I mean, you know, appeals are granted yeah. all the time. It's not unusual, mm -hmm. but I would say that in the vast majority of appellate cases in the criminal realm, uh, the verdicts are upheld. Okay. And then it goes to the, the next level of appeal. So for example, if there's a, you know, there's a South Carolina court of appeal, and then mm -hmm. the appeal from there would go to the South Carolina Supreme court. That's a court that uh, is of limited jurisdiction and they can decide what cases they want to take and what cases they don't want to take, similar to the United States Supreme Court. They they choose what cases they take. And uh, it's it's unusual for them to take a case, uh, you know, where there's a, a guilty verdict. Uh, the Court of Appeal is denied the, uh, any sort of appellate remedy and then for them to take the case unless there's some real issue of great public import and policy, usually. I'm curious to get your take on the uh, gunshot residue, the GSR that was uh, found on a blue poncho-like raincoat uh, found in September at uh, Murdaugh's mother's home in Elmida in Hampton County. A witness uh, in the Murdaugh family caregiver 
uh, uh, Michelle Smith testified that she saw Murdaugh walk into the home roughly about a week after the killings, carrying that blue vinyl object as it's been presented, uh, which in where the raincoat was later found. Uh, Fletcher later testified that there were 38 confirmed particles of GSR with many other particles possible but unconfirmed located on the inside of the rain jacket. Two particles found inside the hood of the coat, at least one on the outside. Uh, One particle of GSR found on Murdoch's seatbelt. Murdoch's defense team uh, cross-examining today on that. Uh, And obviously we're sitting here talking, so I'm not watching and seeing exactly what's happening at this moment. But if you were to prepare to cross-examine on behalf of Murdoch today, uh, are there any holes you feel you can poke into that amount of evidence relating to the gunshot residue? It was a day or two ago you had a a firearms and ballistics expert on. And one of the things that he said was, you know, a shell casing doesn't make the case. Mm -hmm. You need to put it in context with other bits of evidence. And I would say the exact same thing uh, with respect to the GSR. Um, And I don't claim to be some kind of a firearms expert, but you know, that gunshot residue could have gotten on that jacket any number of ways. He could have gone to the range and taken his gun out to the range and Mm -hmm. and shot it. If he lives in a rural area, he could have taken out behind his barn and shot the gun while wearing this particular coat. Mm -hmm. So that piece of evidence as an individual evidence item is of little import. But if you put it together with several other pieces of evidence tending to show that uh, uh, that he used a gun, a particular type of gun at a particular time, wearing a particular bit of clothing that you could then hook up to something else, then it, it becomes an important part of the mosaic. Mm-hmm. And that ends up putting the pieces of that puzzle together. Another piece of the puzzle uh, that... We've heard tes- testimony from witnesses is the voice of Alec Murdo on tape uh, on uh, a TikTok recording uh, that Paul was uh, going to be sending out to a friend uh, while he was taking care of his dog. You hear uh, Paul, you hear Maggie, and then you hear a third voice that sounds like Alec Murdo and many people testifying saying 100% that is him, although he does not appear on camera. How strong is that testimony to have multiple people from uh, former colleagues uh, to uh, friends and such say, yes, this is him, but we don't have his face on camera at the time, uh, right before the murder, where he said he was not. Well, it certainly doesn't help the defense any. No. Um, I think that that's the kind of thing where jurors will probably say, yeah, I'm willing to listen to other people say what whose voice they think it is. But ultimately, I think it's the kind of thing where jurors are going to make their own decision based on listening to that voice for themselves against some known sample of the defendant's voice. Lewis Goodman, former deputy district attorney and experienced Alameda County criminal defense lawyer. Thank you so much for your insight on the Alec Murdoch case. Greatly appreciate that. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts. You don't miss any of our breaking updates and discussions on the cases that we are following for you every single day. You can even get a commercial free experience if you sign up through Apple Podcasts right now. You get a commercial free experience of all of our shows and all of the stories and cases that we are following for you. You can follow me on Twitter at Tony B pod until next time for all of us here. I am Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.